Okay, hi everyone. I'm Miguel Cosmas, and like uh, our chair said, I'm going to talk to you about the market support in the state in contemporary Europe. So I think the best way for us to start really talking about this is situating ourselves in the world. And it's clear, I think, we live in an extraordinary time. And I'm going to talk to you about three economic crises and one fiscal crisis that we're living in today. So first, there's low growth. Uh, Larry Summers, very respected American economist, has come out with this hypothesis of secular stagnation, i.e. permanent low growth. And these are different estimates of the potential GDP. So what is GDP at full capacity in the economy? And this is the actual GDP. And as you can see, uh, it's clearly not matching. And where the economy is not readjusting to what is its potential uh, full, full employment level. And that was the Eurozone, the United States, exactly the same. And this is something that, that's gained quite some traction. And uh, the second economic crisis we have is inequality. <laughs> and we all remember last year, Piketty, there was a Piketty mania, wealth inequality fever. And obviously, one of the main conclusions we draw from his work is this U-curve we have in inequality and how currently uh, this income inequality we have is pretty similar to what we had just before the Great Depression. Um, and so that really shows alarming levels. And, and it, there, there are some studies in terms of economic theory of how inequality then has, is a macroeconomic problem. Then you've got fiscal crisis. I think all of us in Europe are aware of austerity, that we live in an age of austerity. Austerity basically meaning uh, fiscal consolidation, the raising of taxes, and the reduction of spending. Uh, but I think in the United States as well, particularly at state and, and city level, that's, um, that's something that, that we live through. And that's not just about the bloated nature of our debt stock. It's not just about um, you know, us needing to reduce our debt. It's also about the future, us, us having the welfare state expenditures growing because our population is aging, we're going to need to pay more in pensions. <laughs> and it's also because politicians are finding it harder to raise taxes politically, because they, they struggle to justify tax increases, and economically, because it's easy for firms and individuals to evade taxes. But I think of all these of all, of the three crises, this is the one which could be perhaps more narrated or fabricated, in the sense that, really, we've had austerity, but we've also had reductions in inheritance tax in Greece and in the United Kingdom. You've had decreases in taxes on high-income earners and corporations in the United Kingdom and in Portugal and in other countries where there's been austerity. So really, austerity is an excuse for class war. And partially, I think, all these crises and this sense of malaise leads into a sense of anti-establishment, anti-politics feeling. And you've got the spectre of populism. In the United Kingdom, you have Jeremy Corbyn, recently elected leader of the Labour Party, and on the right, UKIP. In the United States, you have Bernie Sanders on the left, and on the right, you have the Tea Party. In Greece, Sarid's on the left, Golden Dawn and Anel, the independent Greeks, Spain, Podemos, and Los Ciudadanos, two uh, grassroots political parties, which are having lots of success right now. Now, the quick question, really to, interesting to study, is why are these crises coinciding at the same time, and what's causing them? And I think the most prescient text here is Colin Crouch's Post-Democracy. And this is the uh, beginning of the 21st century. Post-Democracy basically means there's democracy, and there's a number of transformations. We have something similar to democracy, but it's different. I guess the comparison is post-industrial uh, landscapes where the industries are not no not really there, but they are. There are still some industries there. So they feel slightly different, but they, they're still industries, right? And the key concept to this is commercialization of citizenship. I first want you to imagine your social contract, or imagine it as a parallel to any other contract, like with your mobile broadband provider. Imagine they suddenly say you need to pay more to get your mobile broadband. Imagine they say. I will now provide you worse speed on your mobile broadband, and I will only provide it on a certain few hours of the day. So there's a reduction in the quantity and the quality of the goods provided by the state in your social contract, and also the price that you're paying. So your citizenship is basically being eroded. But there's also, what, what is replacing that in terms of the expenditure of the state? And really that's a state providing services such as active labor market policies and trying to encourage job growth. And so really your citizenship has become access to these labor market promotion activities, access to the government's economic policy. And then Crouch talks about the global firm and its importance in creating this commercialization of citizenship. And then a few years later, when the crisis comes along, he talks about privatized Keynesianism, which is Keynesianism, spending, yes, but privatized. So instead of it being used for the public interest, it's using the interests of firms. Why? Because firms, these days, corporations, have taken what is the general interest of society. And there are other authors in the literature which talk about this, about perhaps corporate capture of the state. Uh, there is 
James K. Galbraith, the predatory states an economic system where entire sectors have been built up to feast upon public si systems, built originally for public purposes. And Mantecato, who is a very influential economist, I don't know if any of you heard yesterday the speech by the new Chalice Chancellor, John McDonnell, and he basically said that he wants to build the entrepreneurial economy, entrepreneurial state, which is her, her book, it's her thesis. And she talked about in this book the socialization of risk and the privatization of losses, leaving a parasitic private sector. I think this is really key to the development of these economic crises and these political crises. And the conclusion we can take really is our economic troubles are a symptom of bad system design. And so you've got market support, this corporate capture of the state operating through these two arms, which Mariana Matucado just described for us, right? The socialization of risk, on one hand, you know, bank bailouts, the state assuming the losses of the private sector. And on the other hand, the privatization of reward. And that's not just privatizations per se. It's also when the state decides to outsource a certain thing or when it, it requires welfare recipients to work a few hours for free. And that will generate, obviously, profits for firms. And so they are having to pay nothing for that labor, but they're still generating profits. And that really, that's really the tale of a state repurposed, as we saw in the James Keel Galbraith. This public systems were built originally for the middle class, but now they serve to help the market. Levy, who comes up with this, with this idea of the market-supporting state, talks about the state authorities having shifted from market steering to market supporting, this idea of repurposing. So then when we situate ourselves in the discipline, we have to understand some of the theoretical problems which we have with the other theories which are around, in order to allow us to understand why this theory is perhaps better equipped to deal with these crises than others. So there's, there's these, all these different uh, theories of the state, competition state, neoliberal state, market-making state, <coughs> including the market-supporting state. And sort of the first one, the obvious one, would be to go with neoliberal state. Everybody knows what neoliberalism is. Problem. It's controversially defined. In the United States, you have Milton Friedman's monetarism. Then you have in Austria, the Austrian school, which is pure laissez-faire. And then in Germany, you have ordo-liberalism, which implies a lot of state participation in the economy. But if for, for some, it's also a meaningless insult. So Hartwich wrote this paper, which is the origins of political swear word, where ne neoliberalism basically doesn't mean anything anymore, because we use it to describe everything that's bad with the world. And so, while ideology is relevant to how the market-supporting state came to be, we should define it independently of that, right? We should come up with a name and a, and a unit of analysis that's independent of ideology in terms of its definition. And so we exclude neoliberal state, we exclude predatory state, we exclude conservative nanny state, because these cast aspersions, value judgments. We want a term which is independent of value judgments. So we're left with these. And then in 2004 comes Colin Hay, and Colin Hay comes up with an influential critique on the competition state and the post Schumpeterian workfare state, two other theories, basically. And the problem with these theories were they just described it. They didn't give any freedom for agents to actually change their minds and make decisions which led these states into being. Without agents, without ideas, they were just bad theories. And so we have to create a theory which has a place for agents, for power, for institutions, and for ideas. And this is why I think the market supporting state provides us with advantages. It has a clear definition of state market relations. All we want to analyze is how the state is now supporting the private sector and how that's led to a parasitic private sector. So we rule out market state, market making states, free of value judgments, like I've said, and provides a role for agents, power, ideas, and institutions, okay? Vivian Schmidt, very influential political economist, in a book called uh, Li uh, Resilient Liberalism in, Europe, in Contemporary Europe, she comes up with this map of different economic governance, different state market relations. On one hand, there's FAIR, sort of the, so the Soviet state, the state does everything. And on the other opposite, you have laissez-faire, where the state does absolutely nothing, the private sector does everything. And that has privatized <coughs> risk, privatized reward, the other one socialized risk, socialized reward. Then you have this alternative, the developmental state, and that's basically, you know, if, if you mess up, that's your own fault. But if you're having a business, then that should, you know, that we should ensure that, that comes out with some benefits for the world. And that was basically the system adopted by France in the 20th century, and also uh, Asian economies. And then you've got what we have right now, which is what I'm positing, socialized risk and privatized reward, the market-supporting state, fair avec, to do with. And that's not just the state, set, the state doing with the private sector, right? They do their activities with the private sector. They bring them in. 
It's also the private sector is doing their activities with the help of the state. Fair avec. I think this really helps us, this image really helps us to uh, understand this. And so my, my claim is the market support is the disease, not the cure. Um, privatizing reward, basically, we know that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That feeds into the problem of inequality. We know that privatized companies don't increase their investments. Studies have revealed that, you know, when you privatize companies, they don't actually invest very much. And so we don't generate growth from privatization. And all this have also shown that the public overpays for outsourced contracts. So that leads to a problem of fiscal crisis. Socializing risk, the same thing. You know, when we bail out the banks, we spend money. The money goes to the wealthy. And there's a moral hazard, which means it keeps happening again. The crises are set into effect by these two different arms of the market supporting states. And but my main claim, one of my main claims here is that corporate welfare also generates welfare dependency. It's basically, you know, originally you have a market for investment opportunities with an equilibrium, and then the state says, I want there to be growth. So I'm going to provide you risk-free investment opportunities. And the supply shifts up. And you have the increase in investments. But then, you know, the private sector says, oh, I quite like this investment with no risk. So I'm going to demand investments with higher returns, or I'm going to stick with my no risk investments. And so you have an increase from V1 to V2. And we go back to where we were before. And the state says, hang on, I want more investments. So I'm going to increase market support again. What does this mean? It's the paradox of market support. Market support is self-reinforcing. It keeps growing with itself. Oh, and Colin Crowd describes this, you know, those seeking profit maximization will do so through the tough roads of market competition only <coughs> if there is no alternative, because it's far easier to make profits through political dealing and corruption. And this basically explains the economic crisis, right? Because we bought time, the inequality generating machine, as the rich save more and the poor, cons uh, the, the rich save more and consume less than the poor, right? And so growing inequality means that we are consuming less and we are saving more. But in order to keep the economy growing, we need to keep consumption growing. And so basically we have to have the rich lending to the poor. And then the poor have to pay that back with interest. And so that feeds the inequality cycle. But obviously if you're the poor, you have these debts and you have to keep paying them back. And the percentage of your income, which you're paying back, grows and grows and grows up to the point where, hey, I can't pay back my debts anymore. And that leads to obviously the, the subprime mortgage crisis and the crisis of 2008, because we can't buy time anymore. And now just to wrap up, um, this links to um, David Harvey and his critical theory ideas. This, this story of the, of, the, of, the, of the economic crisis is basically the overproduction or underconsumption theory, which gains, crisis, which gains currency in times of recession. Mariner Eccles, who was the chairman of the Fed post-1929, during the time of the Great Depression, subscribed to this theory. And um, in the old days, you could just have imperialism, right? You colonize a new country, and that would give you new markets. These days, you can also try and access new markets, you know, open new countries to up with the trade. However, David Harvey comes up with this idea of the spatial fix. So it's not just new, new markets. You can also create new markets within your own country. So imagine you decide to open up education to the, to the private sector and to the market. You're allowing the private sector to flood that and to create profit from that. So you're creating new space. It's not geographic space but it's still space that you're creating. And this is what he terms accumulation by dispossession, in case any of you want to read up on that. It's basically a similar uh, concept to the market supporting states. So where do we go from here just to wrap up? We understand state market relations, right? We understand that the state is supporting the private sector. It's giving them money in order to try and get them to grow desperately. We understand how these are fueling contemporary crises. They are fueling income inequality, they are fueling low growth because these don't generate growth and because inequality weakens growth in and of itself, and it's generating fiscal crisis because obviously we don't have the money to pay for all this machine where the state is basically taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich. And we understand the urgency to change them, right? Everybody wants a world where there is growth, where there are sustainable public finances, you know, where there is low income inequality. And so Antonio Gramsci says, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, in this space, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. These symptoms have appeared. It is up to us to be the midwives of the new. Thank you very much.